All right, Rich, I'm going to turn it over to you. Take it away. Talk about your story and your journey on why, how you ended up on this stage today. All right. Thank you, Jim. So um, I'm on a pretty tight uh, timeline here. So when the food comes, I'm going to end. So I'm going to take my speech and I'm going to speak really fast. If you have any questions or you want to slow me down, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, my name is Rich Lennon. Uh, RVA Property Solutions is the name of my company. Um, last couple of years I've had this, as I go through my journey, and I'll talk about my journey today, I guess that's what I'm really here to talk about. I know Quincy throws like a million numbers at you and it's a lot to digest. Uh, Jeffrey Taylor really blows me away every time he speaks. I really enjoy him. And then I not only did I get to listen to Kevin this morning, but I spent a little time with Kevin. He's staying with me this weekend and really picking him his mind about deal flow. It's just been a great day for me. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. And I'm just going to maybe tell a little bit about my journey and how I ended up here. And I'm just going to get going. All right, so a little bit about myself. I think this is probably appropriate. Um, anytime you're listening to someone speak, maybe you should know a little bit about them, where they're coming from, what kind of investor they are. So let me just give you a brief rundown of who and what I am. Uh, I buy homes. Not surprising in this group, that's fundamentally what I do, right? So I buy houses, uh, pretty exclusively single family residents. I'm not opposed to buying a duplex or a triplex. Maybe it'll enter my portfolio this year, but I'm primarily a single family home guy. I am a buy and hold. So I really think of myself as a long-term investor, as a buy and hold. Um, person, um, although I do flip. I say that I flip houses, I flip them to eat, I flip them to pay for my marketing, I flip them to keep my lights on or whatever it is. Uh, I flip when I really can't figure out a way to keep it. I'm a bit of a house hoarder and uh, sometimes I flip them. I very rarely but occasionally I will wholesale houses. This normally happens when I'm just totally out of money and totally out of ideas and then so I just take it for a quick profit and um, I do lease options. Um, I am. I always try to remember this. I am a professional landlord, and Jeffrey Taylor reminded me today how really I'm not a professional landlord, <laughs> and how many different ways I have to go. So um, I'm growing all the time, uh, and you know I, I've known about the subject two, of course we all do, but really maybe in 2015 I got a little bit more into subject two, taking taking homes where the financing was already in place, kind of ended up being my model by the end of 2015. So. RVA Property Solutions. I opened my doors in 2013. Uh, there really weren't many doors, it was an home office. Uh, I bought my first house about four months later, so I was really just kind of spinning my tires of what is a full-time investor about beating doors, making offers. Um, I currently own 30 plus properties, to be honest, I don't really know how many. Um, I'm doing three to four flips at the moment, um, one seller finance, and the rest I'm now holding as rentals. We probably owned at the most at one time, we owned about 35 homes. My personal, what we do when I'm buying homes, and I'll tell my story today, I'm not always buying homes. A couple times in 2015, I stopped buying homes, but when I do, uh, I've, histor I've historically bought over the last year and a half about three to four deals a month. I'd like to grow that. I'd like to be doing about 10 deals a month. I have a full-time office manager, someone who helps me run my life and helps me run my office. Uh, I have a full-time project manager who runs all my renovation side of my business. Uh, I have a full-time buyer. Uh, we have offered a job to a second full-time buyer. This is people that go out and I give them leads and they go out and they try to put the houses under contract for me. And I'm trying to get another one. So if you know someone who wants to be a full-time buyer in the Richmond market, um, that is, uh, they come talk to me. So this is a little bit about me, a little bit about where my business is, a little bit about how I'm growing my business. All right, and this is what my business has looked like the first couple of years. Uh, 2013 was my first year, it was June 2013. I did three deals that year. Uh, in 2014, I grew and I did 10 deals. Thought I was doing something special, thought I was real proud of myself, all right? And then uh, 2015, we really jumped up and I did about 40 deals. And I'm really trying to get in 2016 to really close to 70 deals this year. So those are kind of where I'm going, where I've been, and where I'm going. And uh, Jim asked me to come up here today and talk about my journey. All right. So I guess I finally got to the title of it here, right? From zero to my first 50 deals in almost three years. I'm not quite there. And I'm just going to tell my story a little bit. I really like this next one. We're all probably entrepreneurs, and we're all type, uh, probably risk takers. Uh, an entrepreneur, 
someone who jumps off a cliff and builds the airplane on the way down. You know, I, I talked about this one time before. That's funny. I think this is an accurate description of my life and my business. Before I jumped, I had an idea of what it was going to look like. I knew what I was doing. I was going to buy some rentals, and I had a picture-perfect plan of what it was going to be. Around month three, it was a totally different plan. And then month seven, it was different. And then month 18, it was different. And it was constantly changing. And the plane that I originally thought I was going to build, I didn't build that at all. I ended up building something totally else. And as an entrepreneur, that's kind of how you have to be. All right? So I went through a lot of trials and tribulations in my first 50 deals. And I don't know, maybe I'm a downer, but I tend to get up and talk about all the ways that I screwed things up. And uh, hopefully give you some insight on maybe how I fixed them and how I got through some of my trials and tribulations. Uh, three things as I'm looking back and I'm thinking about as I, Jim asked me to present and tell the story, hey, what are the things that really helped me get through my business? From when it was a small business to a medium-sized business to a little bigger medium-sized business to where I want to go. I want to be a big business and doing a lot of deals. And there are really three things that kept popping up. Uh, the number one was having a mentor. Having someone who could pick up the phone and answer my question, someone who's been there before me. The number two is education. I don't know why I have an S on there. I know, one of my copies, I know I took that S off there. Education is not really making fun of myself, but it just looks like that. And the why. You know, what's your why? For my why, it's going to be different than your why, so I can only speak to my why. I'll tell you why I do it. Maybe why you do it is a different reason. Uh, but I'll just kind of give you my why. All right, so mentoring. Why do you need a mentor? What has a mentor been? What do they do? And what has it meant to me? I can only speak to my journey and my mentor, right? So my mentor really increases my self-confidence. So when I go out there and I feel like I'm running through the jungle and I don't really know what to do, I have someone who grounds me and tells me, hey, maybe I'm doing something right. My mentor taught me how to take better control of my investments as I grew. So it was easy to keep track of one renovation at a time. When you're growing and you're doing six renovations at a time, sometimes you need a mentor to come in and remind you about what you need to be doing in your business. My mentor taught me how to speak and be heard, how to stand up at ring meetings, how to stand up at RIA meetings, how to put together my own mastermind groups, how to, how to do that. Uh, a mentor educates them, and it's kind of a long sentence, I didn't know how to give this out, a mentor educates them mentor on how to accept feedback as communication, technical skills, and leadership. Basically, uh, someone who call me on my BS, right? Someone who will, if I'm not doing something right in my business, who will call me out on it and say, you need to make this change and you need to do it this way. And someone who's not afraid to say, hey, Rich, you're doing a great job. But rather someone to come in and say, hey, you really need to do this better and this better. And someone who can give you that information. Um, my mentor provided an important networking contact sphere, so it wasn't just him, but it was rather also the people that he introduced me to and the avenues and the ideas that he presented to me. Right? And my mentor helped me uh, better understand the real estate investing culture and the unspoken rules, and this has been a big part, a big critical part of the success of getting through learning to be a real estate investor. You're probably not surprised to learn my real estate invest, my mentor was Jim Ingersoll. So I met Jim Ingersoll online. That sounds a little bit awkward, but a lot of people meet guys online. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not the only guy he's met online in this room. Uh, so Jim was moderating, Jim was moderating a website and he was doing what he was doing. He was probably fairly new into the mentoring and fairly new into the education. This is three or four years ago, and I just hounded him. I sent him texts, I sent him emails, and since I lived in the Richmond market, I just wasn't going to give up until he went out and he met me for lunch with him. Actually, that's not true. He's pretty good and gracious about meeting me out there. And poor Jim, he showed up at the Chick-fil-A, and I must have had four pages of handwritten notes, and he graciously sat there, probably in his mind chuckling at me, because he probably sat in front of a hundred investors before me, that asked a million questions, and he graciously gave me his time, he gave me his wisdom, and he's been a big instrumental part of my success. And I'm going to kind of weave him through my journey here in the next, uh, in the next uh, couple of minutes here. All right? The next one is education. Um, you're constantly educating yourself. I really like this quote. Um, the only person who is educated is the one who has learned how to learn and change. 
when you jump off of that cliff on that airplane and you realize really quick that that airplane is not going to give you what you need, you need to learn to change. And I see a lot of people fail in this business because they come in and they say, this is how I'm going to do it. This, is, this, is my, this idea, this worked for me five years ago, this worked for me ten years ago. And the people that are unwilling to change and they're unwilling to adapt, they're just not going to succeed in the business. And for me, that's part of an education. And I couldn't find a quote on this one, but I think it's really important is you should know your source. For a lot of you in the room, I'm just some Joe standing up in the middle of the room telling you about my story. And so you should take that into account. And whether you're listening to Jim or Quincy or Walter or you're listening to these guys, you really should know your source for it's me or the next guy. And take your information from someone that you can learn to trust. All right? And the why. So understanding your why. My why might be different than your why, but I'll tell you my why. This is my why. My why is legacy and retirement. So I've got three little kids, and I'm thinking of things like college, and I'm thinking about the times that I'm not going to be here. And so I'm personally building, and this is why I'm a long-term buy and hold guy, I'm building for the future. I'm building for the generation beyond me. And quite frankly, I'd like to spend my time in the Caribbean on a boat, all right? That's a pretty good way for retirement. Uh, I'll get back to this picture later on. This picture over here actually has a little bit of meaning for me, and I'll get to it. So my why and how it really comes out of my business is we have a saying in my, my business, and it's just me and my wife, all right? And it is jelly doesn't care. And if you've heard me speak before, you might have heard me talk about this. But this is the kind of the way it works. If you can explain your contractor problem to this two-year-old, then it matters. <laughs> so when you talk to this two-year-old for five minutes about why the contractor didn't show up and the city permit guys come over and pop you on the head and the private money fell through and you were supposed to close on this, and then they look up at you and they just say, yeah, can you put on Dora? You know, they, they really don't care. My daughter only cares whether I will provide her a college education, will I provide her a roof over her head, that's all that she cares about. And I try to keep that in mind. So when things go bad, when it's gotten tough, I just remind myself that my daughters and my son, they don't care. They simply care whether I succeed or fail. And this has pulled me through some rather rough times. All right? I don't know why that one's blank. All right? So here's my journey. All right? All right. How will a mentor and education and understanding my why got me through? So 2013, every journey begins somewhere. That's my first step. 2014, kind of learning the real estate business. 2015 was just tremendous growth. And then 2016, I kind of laid out some of my goals. All right, so 2013 is when it began for me. It was in June. Uh, I had built some websites, a little bit about me before. I built some websites around 2009, 2010. I mean, they weren't Google, but right? I didn't go out and sell them for a whole bunch of money. I was driving traffic and I built about 30 websites and then I sold them. And I didn't have to work for a couple years. I retired. I certainly didn't have enough money to retire. Where it really ended up being I was a stay-at-home dad for a couple years. Right? I said, hey, I'm gonna stay home with my kids. This will be great, it'll be wonderful, I'm spending my time. So then when my wife said to me, hey Rich, the third kid's on the way, they're gonna be here at the, uh, by the way, June 2013, notice when I started the business. The third child arrived. And, and I was looking around about how to get going again, all right? So uh, I looked at franchises. Uh, I'd had some experience in real estate. I'll talk about that a little bit later. I was an accidental landlord. I bought some property up in Northern Virginia, so I had a little bit of experience. And then I, then I watched Jim's videos. I really stumbled across them, and I don't know what it was. Maybe it was the simplicity of the videos is, I think, what it really was, Jim. Uh, he really laid out a step-by-step -step procedure for me to get going. And Hey, what do I do when I wake up on, you know, on Monday? What do I do when I wake up on Tuesday? But whatever it was, it really motivated me and, and galvanized me, and I jumped in. So now I'm a full-time investor, all right? So what did my mentor and my educator, who really both sources that first year were Jim and Jim's educational programs, right? So I didn't know what wholesale, I had no idea what wholesaling was. Uh, I was totally green. Um, I, my mentor and my educator, they taught me the techniques that I began to implement in marketing. They provided me with documents. And, and those of us who've been doing deals for a long time right now, we might not remember how important those documents were those first couple deals, right? You're horrified and so scared that you're going to make these horrendous mistakes on documents. The document flow ended up being really important for me for the first year or two. And I really provided that by my educator and my mentor. 
right? So uh, it taught me how to put things under contract it, through his videos, and um, it taught me how to market. And so I was off running. And so my why was I was going to build and provide for my family, and then my mentor and educator that year really provided me the information, provided me the guidance to get going. All right, my first opportunity to quit was really right around the third or fourth month. So if you've ever started a business or you've been out there and I was working 40, 50, 60 hours a day making offers to everybody I could, where's Luke? Is he here? <coughs> I made Luke show me like 100 homes in that first four months. And I bid on every home. I grabbed his poor real estate agent around, his real estate agent. Jim suckered him into like making me go and, and take him out to all these homes. And I was really frustrated and really spinning my wheels. And um, I struggled to make offers in the end. No one would accept them. Why would I make these low ball offers, right? It, I remember someone said today, your stomach had to hurt to make the offer. And then I didn't want to make the offers because they were too low and it was, it was really tough. I started mailing. Anybody had someone from me direct mail call you and yell and scream at you? Yeah. That is not pleasant the first time. I was shocked. Like I'm, I would send you an email, hey, I'd like to buy your house. And then they're screaming at me. Right? It was a very awkward, it was a very difficult time, and it really was a point where I could have quit. All right? So for me, in this moment, it was my why. Because when I explained the problem to her, she really <laughs> didn't care. Right? She's, she's looked disappointed in Daddy. Because right? Daddy can't get a deal. Right? So... <laughs> oh, I love that picture. All right? And uh, so... Finally, it happened though. We all get there, we all get to our first deal. All right, and so this one was mine. This is the deal that finally launched me off, finally got me off this night. So this was, I stole this straight from Jim's video, just straight stole it, all right? So I had no deal, I didn't know how to get a deal, but I posted something on Craigslist that said, hey, if you're a bird dog, I'll train you how to get a deal. So when I say know your source, that person really didn't know their source very well. Because the truth is, I didn't know what I was doing. And so I met this person for lunch. And I said, you know what you're going to do today? On Saturday, you're going to wake up. And because I was really struggling with the no. I'm so sick of everybody telling me no. I said, wake up for four sale by owners on Saturday morning on Craigslist. Call them and offer them half of what they're offering on Craigslist. And then, you know, give me a call in a couple of hours after they've been screaming at you for a little while. All right? <laughs> to my shock, someone called up and said, hey, I have somebody who lives in Williamsburg, owns this house. He wants to get rid of his daughter. He listed it for 122 or 125 on the website on, on Craigslist, and I think he's going to make a deal. I think, he's, I think he'll drop his price. So I went out. I met him. And I signed a contract that day for $48,000 on the house. The house looks a little rough on the outside, but the truth is, it was really good on the inside. I tried to wholesale this to my, to my mentor, right? He had helped me out, so I contacted him. But he was out of town that week. He's still mad about it, this house, right? Because I, didn't, I only made, I, I wholesaled this. I, Jim didn't get back to me in time. Mm -hmm. Didn't get back to me in time, Jim. Because <laughs> I wanted to put this on Craigslist, right? And so I put it up on Craigslist and I sold it. I think it was 62 or 60 the next day. So I had someone out there at like 10 a.m. in the morning. They had the contractor out and I had signed the contract. By the time Jim got back in time, I'm like, hey, it's out. It's gone, right? Too late, right? But this one, it really provided me about twelve dollars or $14,000 in capital. Provided me a tremendous amount of confidence. And it really launched it back into my business, and I put it back into the business, started marketing, and then by the end of the year, in a sh fairly short time, I picked up my first two rentals. One was a HUD, poor Luke, who had been dragging me around forever, finally got paid off of a HUD close, right, so I got a HUD. I have not had many HUDs since then. This was the HUD. And the other one was from another wholesaler. And of course, I didn't know how to get an assignment or do an assignment, so of course I called my mentor, and he talked me through the paperwork. And I didn't know this at the time, but has anybody noticed if you're doing a lot of deals that they all close on the same day? They all close on, it's always a Friday, right? Because the lawyers want to get paid for their weekend or whatever it is. But they all seem to close on the same day. I don't know how it works out. So the first day I bought houses, I actually bought two. So on the same day, on my first day, I bought these two houses. And my mentor played one more role with me uh, this year, and and uh, that was when I called him up and gave him my renovation costs. So the renovation for the cost on this one was like thirty-five or forty thousand dollars, and this one over here was about twenty-five or thirty. 
And, you know, Jim just did that awkward pregnant pause. He said, well, you know, do, you, do you really need to do that with the budget? Do you, I was like, he said, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, I'm going to be like Luke. I'm going to blow out some walls. I'm going to make it all HD TV and just make it beautiful. But you know, well, you know, you probably don't want to do that. And Jim really helped me restructure that construction loan. And so just on that one deal and that one conversation, I kind of calculated out on that Hallmark property, the one on the right, he saved me $20,000 that day. As we know, we put the money into the rentals, into things like new doors and new cabinets. I didn't need to do that. I was fairly new. These were my first rentals as a professional. And having that mentor really made a difference <coughs> on my bottom line. Right. So now, because I didn't spend that $20,000 on this property over here, now I'm probably making an additional $150 to $200 per month because I'm not financing that cost. So that not only saved me the cash that day, but now it's an extra $150 to $200 a month in my pocket because I didn't have the right, I have to finance that $20,000. So having that mentor was really, this was the first time it really cemented to me, not only could I get the education, but how is this really going to impact my bottom line of my business? Having somebody with the experience to direct me and help me navigate was really crucial. All right? So, 2014. So I go into the next year. Hey, I've done three deals. I'm feeling pretty good, right? So I have to put it right here, my sophomore year. We're all sophomores, right? Uh, sophomores know everything, right? They got the freshman year. They're, they're geniuses, right? So uh, this is my year. So uh, 2014, wholesale a couple of deals. I flipped my first three homes. I was hungry. I needed to eat a little bit. And I probably added around five uh, rental properties to my portfolio. Um, I began to understand marketing, which has really increased my deal flow. And I, <laughs> Jim... I'm always picking on Jim or telling you everything I grabbed from Jim, but he on his uh, on his educational thing, he had broken down like 35 different ways to generate leads, and so I literally I whiteboarded those 35 and I worked them every single day, right? So I went this lead source, I'm going to do this today, and that lead source, and I massaged the leads, and that's how my marketing really took off, and I really began to create deal flow for myself, all right? So. I've got deal flow, and I spoke last year at this convention, and I, I spoke for an hour about all the problems I dealt with in 2014. This year I broke that same speech down into one slide, right? So as, you, as you're going through the investor, you're learning so much all the time as it grows, right? So now that I have deal flows, I need a buyer's list. I need someone to go out and get a buyer's list. So I had someone who helped train me on my, on my buyer's list. I had contractor <coughs> issues, so I went from doing one house at a time to now I was doing maybe two houses and I was doing one every two months. And so it was a very different contractor situation. I had a contractor who ran out this year with like $20,000. Oops, okay? So I had to get advice and I needed help navigating on how to get through these issues. I had money issues. And here was the money issue. I didn't have enough money to buy all the deals that I wanted to buy. So I really needed someone to teach me something about private money. I had no idea. The first deals I did with my own money. But you can only do so many deals with your own money. And as most seasoned investors learn, you don't want to do any deals with your own money. So it was really this year that Jim really helped me with my money issues. And I didn't have Jeffrey Taylor over my landlord. I was just kind of winging it along. And I really depended on Jim to help me out with my landlord issues. I was putting, land, I was putting tenants in, and I put five or six tenants in that time along with what everything else was going to do. And I'm not sure I took the first warm body that showed up with the money, but I probably made a couple mistakes along this line here. And landlording and taking the phone calls, uh, dealing with city permits, insurance issues. I calculated out the other day, I have like 54 insurance policies. Ah, oh, God, stab me in the eye. All right? So you need someone who help, can help you navigate that because I never really understood that I had to be an expert at insurance. Who wants to do that? I certainly, when I jumped off the plane, uh, off the cliff and built my plane, that was never an expectation that I was going to have to really learn what that was all about, right? And then my business structure: how am I going to buy it? My name? I'm going to buy it in an LLC? I'm going to buy it in a trust? These were all some major obstacles that I that I really went through in 2014. And my mentor was there for me and really helped me navigate it. Jim provided me wholesale assignments. He explained it to me. I'd never done one before. It gave me not just a first purchase agreement or a second purchase agreement in a different situation. He provided rental agreements for me, uh, rental applications, and we can go through. I know we're a, a really experienced group, 
But we know the amount of document flow that now doing all kinds of different deals in a different way because a flip document flow is very different than a rental document flow, which is very different than a wholesale document flow, which is very different than a seller financing document flow. And then you have to have all your contractor document flows. So it becomes very complicated and a very difficult road to navigate. And I, Jim helped me through it. All right, I got my first trust agreement. Uh, I really talked about trust a little bit more in 2015. Kind of fell in love with the trust, but I also got my first trust agreement through my mentor. All right, but why? I was feeling pretty good. The only thing that at the end of 2014, maybe, you know, as you might see here, I'm a Redskins fan. Wife and I are a big Redskins fan, so here we are in a Redskins game, but out of one box. All right, see, anybody who's a Redskins fan can be an investor, right? Because you know you're in for the long haul. <laughs> Oh my God. Don't get me going on this. Right. I actually took vacation. I don't think I'd taken a vacation in about five or six years, and so we took a vacation this year. Um, not that we could have taken one before, but sometimes the little rugrats at that age, they're really hard to move around. Uh, but at the end of 2014, uh, it, it was a great year, and uh, that was it. All right? So 2015. All right? 2015 for, you, for me was the year of growth. Um, I did about five wholesale deals. I did about 10 to 15 flips, right? And I probably added around 20 uh, rental properties to my portfolio, all right? So if you think about those numbers in terms of growth, from year one to year two, I grew 300%, right? And then from year two to year three, I grew 400%, right? And when we all, we all shake our heads and say, wow, that's kind of cool. We'd all probably like to have that growth in our business model, right? We all kind of like that on a piece of paper. But I'm telling you, it was problematic. It was difficult to go from where we were to all this growth. growth. Things that went wrong. Every system I had broke. Every single system that I had. So my acquisition, my contractor system, I was really going from, um, I was doing two renovations at a time to now I'm doing six and seven renovations at a time. It's a totally different beast, right? So I had to go through that and I tell you, I took some knocks, but I had a mentor who helped me work through it, right? My landlord system, uh -huh. could have used you this year, Mr. Taylor, right? My landlord system, I was moving people in and out so fast that I'd have renovations done and they might, and they might sit there for a month before I could even market it. I was just so busy with my life, right? So my financing system, system was a wreck. I had to buy and to find private money for all these deals. And so I was always looking for the next one because I'm a hoarder. I like to keep them all. I could have wholesaled them, but I was committed to doing it a different way, right? And my financing model for my rentals, which I'll talk about a little bit later, was to buy, renovate, rent, and then refinance and get my money back and do it again, right? So that was my process through 2015. My business structure, I quickly learned, was wrong. I needed a property management company, I needed a holding company, I needed a short-term holding company, I needed something above it, around it, underneath it, you know, I sat down with every lawyer in Richmond, sat down with my mentors, but building that structure was very complicated and it was difficult. I had so many leads and so much marketing that people would call me and leave me a message, oh my God, I gotta sell my house, it would take me a week to two weeks to get back to them, and that's even if I got back to them, right? So the system was broke. Administrative paperwork, so we did 40 deals, 15 of them were flips maybe, so that means we had about 55 closings that year, and that's a closing a week, right? So that's just the end of it. So we had to get it under contract, we have to flow, we have to, when you're flipping, you gotta get the punch list. There's so many different angles. That the administrative side was just overwhelming. And invoices, people would pay me, I walk around with my check and I could literally drive around in Richmond doing six renovations. They all had five different subs. So they all wanna get paid on Thursday or Friday or whatever it is. But I would go through one and two checkbooks a day just writing invoices. <laughs> and so I realized I would lose, I, would, I literally would lose the whole day. Uh, eight hours for doing nothing other than giving people money. You know, it really wasn't the right way to do it, right? Private money payments. And these, we went from having one mortgage when I started my own house to buy, in 2015, one month, I think I paid 36 mortgages. 
right? So mortgages became just the ability to track the mortgages. I wrote them all by hand at one point, and then I decided to automate them. I said, hey, that's a better idea, right? Let me automate them that go out. So we certainly did that. So I'll tell you an embarrassing story. I forgot to move one of them. <laughs> Oops. So I had one of my private money call, uh, calls and I said, hey, Rich, how are you doing? Yeah. Hey, um, how come you haven't paid me in four months? <laughs> what? what? So your heart sinks, and you're like, your business is your relationships. And I have a great relationship with that money lender. We still have a great relationship. We got paid up in like four hours or something. But we were making mistakes, all right? Understanding the Quest IRA procedures, when they say self-directed, they really mean self-directed. They will not help you. <laughs> They might say, hey, don't do that. You know, that's the beauty of Quest. And uh, I know Quincy now, and I can call him up and give you that information. But when it says directed, it truly means self-directed. And that means you have to make sure that the money gets back to the right accounts and that it's coming out the correct way. And there's a whole procedure that goes with it, right? So with cash flow issues, hey, the house is supposed to sell, but then the house doesn't sell. And we're depending on that cash because we're going to buy another house. I talked last year about my free house deal of where the bank literally, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> so the bank literally, I was using a close, it was a refinance out of that bank, and then I was closing a purchase at the same bank the next day. Hey, you know, we'll keep it in the same bank, everything will go smooth, what could go wrong? <laughs> so the day before, they called me up and they said, hey, we're having some problems with your with your appraisal. I said, whoa, I'm surprised. What's wrong with the appraisal? They said, it appraised for too much. I said, what are you talking about it appraised for too much? I said, yeah, it appraised for 110. And I said, okay, I'm only asking for $65,000. That sounds reasonable. And they said, well, if it had appraised for $95,000, we'd give you the money. I said, what are you talking about? Right? So I, this is a true story. And the problem is, I because I, I had made so much money in less than six months, I triggered all these all these uh, warning signs in the bank, and I, I had to go by their guidelines. And because it was worth too much money, I almost lost a deal the next day that basically I was going to walk away with the free house. All right? So I had cash flow issues. Uh, paperwork and contractor uh, contract issues. Talked about that a little bit briefly on the administrative side. Um, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of paperwork. A lot of paperwork in uh, 40 deals. All right? So, yeah, and during 2015, 2015, I really needed the full brain trust uh, to bring them in. And I just kept explaining my problems to them, and they just, they didn't care. And so, if it was, really, I know the mod, but you know, they seem cute to me, all right? All right, so, so I'm gonna now kind of, now I told you maybe my business path through 2015, maybe I'm gonna try to tell you how I made it through some of those. There is partly the why. No matter what happens, I have to succeed. I cannot quit. All right? All right. So this year, 2015, mentoring and education took on a different level. Okay, the food's here. Okay, we're almost done. All right, we're at the end. We're in 2015. We're almost there. All right. But I think you might like a couple of things here because I'm going to talk about the love shack. All right? All right, so... Mentoring change in that my mentor really opened up the door to other people. And some of those other people are sitting in the room right with us right now. Quincy and Walter. Amy used to teach us on trust on the IRA firmwalls. I met Kevin Straw. Got to know some groups in here in Richmond. And so the mentoring really changed for me. And it wasn't any longer just Jim, although Jim remained a focal point of, uh, of what I was doing. Uh, but I really began to expand and meet other investors like myself going through some of the trials and tribulations. So my first exposure to that was on the IRA fund cruising in January 2015. So as I was growing massively, I was then every month, as you'll see through, I was putting myself around a bunch of experienced investors who could really help me navigate all my problems, right? All right, so you know, my takeaways, and I'll just try to give you the brief takeaways from each one of these events. The 2015 was the, was the time where I decided that I was gonna buy everything in trust. So, Prior to the 2015 uh, fund cruise, I was buying in LLCs, and then after that cruise, I made a huge shift in the business, and I bought everything in trust, right? It was the first time I had heard the phrase, financial friends, and I didn't really know what that was, and it took me a little bit of a while to find out what's a financial friend, 
what does that mean? Right? So I was so excited. I was so excited that I went down, uh, on that cruise in January. I met Walter Wolford on that cruise, and I signed up for his Love Shack event. I know a couple of you have heard about it. I'll tell you what the Love Shack is. Love Shack is it's a house. I don't know how to explain it. It's a house that sits on a reservoir uh, down in Jackson, Mississippi. It's got like seven bedrooms, five bathrooms, something like that. Big house. And Walter would have a gathering down in his house. And 15 investors would come down. We would literally not lock ourselves in the house, but we'd walk in there on Tuesday. And I don't know that I left the house until Sunday when I went to get my flight. And in that meeting, I think the... You know, I think the name of it was like Land Trust Firewalls or something like that, right? Not something, I don't remember it that way. I remember it as, number one, I remember Old and Treacherous, right? And Old and Treacherous were the enders that Walter had invited down. So these are guys who owned hundreds and hundreds of houses. And they were doing hundreds and hundreds of deals over their lifetime. And I got to spend 15 hours a day with them. I woke up at 5 in the morning just to hang out with Terrell and Keith. Those are the old timers in the group, and they get up at like 5 in the morning, okay? And then we talk about their life and everything that they, they were going through, and then at the end, I'd be up with the younger crowd, that 24 crowd, drinking a glass of wine till 1 o'clock in the morning. And I, I can't put into words what I, what I learned or how powerful that was, because yeah, there was an agenda. Yeah, I learned about trust. Walter had some things that he was trying to teach us, but it was really the relationships and the friendships that I got down there, right? What, what I learned out of this one is listen to old and treacherous. The old and treacherous are the guys who have, you know, Walter calls them that jokingly, old and treacherous, right? They're always the guys who figure out how to do the deal the best way. They've been in the business for 30 or 40 years. They're independently wealthy. They don't need to be doing it anymore. They're doing it because they enjoy it. Right? And the lessons that they had when we were trying to make deals with them, they'd always back us into the corner and they had us just boxed in very quickly when we tried to negotiate with them. But I really learned from those guys. And Walter calls them old and treacherous. It stays with me. Walter also let me know that everything I was doing in my business structure was 100% incorrect. All right? <laughs> There's a friend for you. It, it, it really was. You need people like that. Uh, Terrell gave me some great advice, and I've heard it here a little bit today, and I'll pass it on. I don't have the same power as Terrell, but he told me to, he must have said it to me 10 times. He told me to stop thinking for the other side of the table. So we would be talking about scenarios. I'd say, well, you know, the seller's not going to want to do this. And I'd start to go down that road, and he'd stop me. He said, stop thinking for the other side of the table. And it really changed the way that I made deals. And I, I stopped saying, wow, the seller's really never going to accept this. I had someone who had been doing it for 50 years, and he'd be square in the eyes, and you know what, the seller is going to do that. Not everyone, but you need to stop thinking for the other side. I really learned maybe what a financial friend is. A financial friend is someone who can help me move my IRA. I can't move my own IRA, right? But I need someone that I can trust, who's maybe in a different market, who has deal flow. And I need to go out and meet that person, and now I can do deal <coughs> flow. And I've learned what a financial friend is. How I can help them, and how they can help me. <coughs> a blank stare at 6 a.m. from Keith and Terrell really freaked me out and changed my business model, right? So I was sitting down there at 10 a.m., and I remember vividly Keith had a donut in his mouth, okay, and Terrell was drinking a cup of coffee, and I told him, hey, I'm, I'm buying, I'm renovating, I'm renting, and then I'm refinancing with the traditional bank. And they both froze. Like, it was a, a moment that I couldn't have set up. I could have asked them politely, hey, what do you think about this business model? But when I saw old and treacherous stand there and not take his cup of coffee, I knew I was doing something wrong. They politely let me know the things that I was doing wrong. But that moment is crystallized in my mind. And at 6 o'clock in the morning, eating a bagel, I really changed my business model with the love shot. All right? Number two, I went there a second time. Because remember, my business is booming. I come back in town, I'm making changes, but I'm really starting to learn the value of going down and hanging out with a guy 15 hours from Indianapolis who does it totally different than I do and help me get through and manage some of my problems. For this one, uh, Love Shack 2 is all about broker representation and tax evasion. No tax evasion, by the way. That was the theme. I think it was, again, it was like trust firewalls or seller financing with the name of it. But what happened was, 
we were really pushing what is allowed within the tax code and what was not allowed within the tax code. And poor every time Casey Jackson opened his mouth, Walter would scream, tax evasion, tax evasion. But it was really 15 investors really talking about tax strategy, what's tax aversion, what's tax evasion. And we had someone with the knowledge to steer us and help us navigate it, right? Uh, broker representation was another one that week. Walter must have yelled, broker representation 30 times. And what he was doing, he was just weaseling in all of our deals. Because that's what we were doing down there. We were making deals. And Walter weaseled in all the time. He's going to make a 1000 here, a 2000 there. He wasn't really making deals. I don't think he got a nickel on his broker representation. But he really changed my, my idea of, I don't have to make the deal the way I thought. I can make a small piece of a lot of deals. And Walter opened my eyes to all the different avenues in which I could make money in a deal. And it really broadened my horizon. It was amazing. Right? I know we're running low. All right. Uh, Roll Shack number three was all about the Richmond Mafia. Jim, uh, Jim grabbed a group of us from Richmond. We went down in the Love Shack environment. And I really turned what were competitors at the time into friends. And we went down there and we exchanged ideas in our own marketplace. And Walter has a way of making everybody share. It's just his nature. And um, it, the Love Shack event number three was in my own market. They, these are the people who helped me through my problems that I was facing that year. Right? And I kind of ended my last mentor educational moment on the, uh, on the 2000, at the end of the year, the 2015, it was like November. And my two big takeaways from that one are real estate automation. So that all the things that I was spending all my time doing contracts and, and bids and my marketing leads, I was talking to people that were doing hundreds of deals a month. What's that guy in Ohio saying is doing all the wholesale deals? He really, Scott, he really opened up my eyes to what Podio and what automation can do. And then I've been back since then in the last two or three months and I've really automated my business. Right? And another thing that really stuck with me was on the IRA fund cruise, and if I could articulate what I really got out of the cruise, is I was cruising around on a catamaran, and I had a, I had a deal that I was going to hold my breath. I was going to wholesale to Jim, because I, I couldn't figure out how to get the money because I had so many deals to do. Right? So I got on that catamaran that day, and by the end of the day, with no planning on anything, sitting in this crystal clear water here, hanging out in the Petons, Sorry, Jim. one of my Richmond Mafia members, just, I, was, I walked up to him and they were in a group and someone said, hey, what are you doing? I said, well, you know, I got this deal. And I walked away from that with my funding for my next deal. And I never anticipated it. I didn't ask that person for money. It just happened because I put myself around the people that were gonna help me. And it was after I got that deal and I was riding home on a boat, and I don't know if you can look at this picture correctly, but there's a rainbow here. But also, if you look through the bottom of that, you'll see that you're looking at the bottom of the rainbow. I don't know how many times in your life that you've actually looked at a rainbow and you can say, by the way, I didn't say a pot of gold down there, right? But it's actually happened to me three times in my life. Once was right after this on the way home, and I just snapped a picture of it, and it kind of crystallized things in my mind. Of, uh, hey, I've really found something here. My, my life is really changing. I'm achieving the things that I want to achieve. And you know, God threw me a little bow and let me see that. And it was a, it was a powerful moment for me. All right? 2016. All right, automation. I've been to automation. I'm going to get to 70 deals. Um, I'm going to flip the table a little bit. I'm trying to become, a mem I'm come, become my own mentor. I try to teach people. I've done bird dog classes. I set up my own mastermind. And so I kind of flip the table on the mentor. I try to educate. I get in front of my ring group. I get in front of my RIA group. And I've tried to make this year be about me being the mentor and me being the educator. Remember, Jelly doesn't care. You either get it done or you don't get it done. All right? A shameless plug. All right? Uh, I've got a bird dog class on Saturday mornings, every other Saturday morning. I don't charge a thing. You show up, teach you how to go find deals, and hopefully I'll build a relationship and you can bring me some deals. All right? I have a mastermind group that meets here in the local market every Tuesday. It's a very small group. If you're interested in it and you think you can contribute, you're welcome to come and talk to me about that. Um, I am always looking for long-term funding. I'm committed to not using banks anymore. So if you know or you're interested in a long-term funding, that was my shameless plug about what I need in life. 
Okay, remember, crisis, everything that went wrong, it led to the growth. Be an entrepreneur, not a entrepreneur. I love that Mark Cuban guy, right? All right, darkness is before the dawn, blah, blah, blah. We solve opportunity. Oppor ugh. And every problem is an opportunity. And basically, we buy other people's problems. And don't forget that. So when you say, my, my life is full of other people's crabola, well, that, you bought it, so you know, deal with it. Right? <laughs> All right, my name is Rich Lennon. Uh, this is my phone number. This is my email address. If you want to reach out to me, I know there is food that is getting cold out there. So hopefully we'll get out there and eat. Walter, you missed the whole thing on the Love Shack and the IRA. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, Wally. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was good. It was good. How about Rich Lennon, huh? Yeah. Wow. All right, thanks for saying, Rich.